left off last time on page 326 with this problem. The first part of this is pretty simple. You just want to know the time required to go to this object that's rotating begins at rest at one and a half rate radius per second squared. And we wanted to know how long does it take to go through the first two revolutions. Here we wrote all of our known quantities of magnetic law and angular acceleration and our theta. Uh, theta not, of course, is zero because it began at that position of zero. And then we can solve this and find the time. Is that right? Four, five, one, three, um, right, two, yeah, about two seconds. All right, so uh, now we want to. Uh, is that right? Four pi over three is two seconds. The root of four pi over three. It is. Okay. All right. Um, so now we want to find how much is time. How much time is required to travel through the next two revolutions? So for part B, we need to write what are our new quantities. And now in this case, you know, usually our theta naught is equal to zero, but in this case, our theta naught is not going to equal zero. Our theta naught will equal uh, four pi radians because it travels through two revolutions. So it travels through this displacement. And so in the next two revolutions, our theta naught will be uh, four pi. So it's, it's beginning again. And then we want to know uh, our theta final will be eight pi radians. All right, now we also want to know what our omega naught is. All right, and we don't know what our omega naught is right off. But our omega naught will be that speed when it's gone through those first two revolutions. So we can find out what our omega naught is. We can say that, um, I'm going to do it up here. We can say that omega equals omega naught plus alpha t. But this is still dealing with the first two revolutions. And we want to know what is the speed after it's traveled through those two revolutions. So omega then will equal to 0 plus 1.5 times 2 seconds, or 3 radians per second. So that is the speed after the thing has traveled through two revolutions. That's the speed that it's traveling at the angular speed. Uh, when it reaches this 2 seconds, that's also going to be our omega naught down here. So we have two scenarios. We have the first two revolutions, and then we have the next two revolutions. I mean, in the first two revolutions, it requires two seconds. And at the end of that, that segment, it's traveling at three radians per second. And then we go into our next set of two revolutions, where our final velocity here becomes our initial velocity here. Get with me on this? We're dealing with two parts to this problem. The first part is traveling through two revolutions. And then the next part are the next two revolutions. In the first part, our omega naught is equal to zero. And our omega final is three radians per second. And then in our next part, this three radians per second becomes our initial velocity for the second part. Yeah? Okay, so uh, I also know that alpha is still the same. It's equal to 1.5 radians per second squared. Yes. Four pi over three is what it is, but then you take the square root of that. The root of four pi over three, right? That's twelve over three, four root of four is two seconds. It's not exactly two, right? Pi is 3, 4 times 3 is 12, over 3 is 4, root of 4 is approximately 2. Yeah, about 2. Right, Tom? Okay, 2.04. Tom? Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, um, so now our alpha is 1.5 radians per second squared. That's constant throughout the whole problem. That's its rate of acceleration. And I want to know t. So I say that theta equals theta naught plus omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. And then I solve that for t. The only unknown that I have is, uh, is t. So I can take eight pi 
is equal to 4 pi plus omega naught, which is going to be 3 radians per second, times t, plus a half of 1.5, times t squared. And I solved that for t. So we'd use the quadratic. I'll just set it up. Uh, this is going to be a half of 3 halves. That's 0.75t squared plus 3t minus 4 pi equals 0. This is your a, this is your b, and this is your this is your c. And then you can solve that with a quadratic. Uh, t is negative b plus or minus all over, what is it in the denominator? 2ab, is that right? 2ac. I always get that mixed up. No, it's 2ab, isn't it? Yeah, it's just 2 a. Just 2a. Okay. Whatever. All right, so um, if, if you have to use a quadratic, I'll provide that to you in any of the problems. You don't need to memorize that. Alrighty. There's some more kinematics problems in the homework for you to practice with. Uh, this one was a little bit different than one that we've done before, so I want to work through it. We'll see some more kinematics. Likely your kinematics problem will be part of a bigger problem, which we're going to get into in Chapter 8. So Chapter 7 is, is really just sort of a leading into Chapter 8 to introduce all the various principles. All right, so in Chapter 7 we had basically just a few things, angular displacement, angular velocity and angular acceleration. Uh, those things are all related by the derivative. So the derivative of position is velocity. The derivative of velocity is position. Uh, remember, in the if they're going clockwise, then we count that as a negative value. If they're going counterclockwise, we count that as a positive value. Uh, and then we had those kinematics equations. The theta equals omega naught t plus 1 half alpha t squared, and on and on. And you'll have that on your equation sheet as well. All right. We had centripetal forces as well. Centripetal forces where we can also apply Newton's second law, where we say that F is equal to MA, where A is our centripetal acceleration. You want to work through another problem? All right, maybe from an old test or something. Let me see what I can find here. Um, I think that's all I had on this one, but I'll look at another. kinematics problems here. Uh, usually the kinematics gets socked in with other problems, so we might not be able to find one. No, these are all... Let's go further back. Okay, here's a good problem. This one's simple, but it, it could be a, a problem on the test. Uh, this is from follow six. I give the angular position, 1t plus 4t squared minus 8t to the fourth, where theta is in radians and t is in seconds. And at t equals zero, I just want to know what is the uh, point's angular position in radians at t equals zero. So this is our function, theta equals 1t plus 4t squared minus 8t to the fourth. <laughs> what is the point's angular position at t equals 0? That should be a quick one. What is it? If t equals 0, what is theta? It's equal to 0, right. So I'm just asking you to plug in the time. So this is 1 times 0 plus 4 times 0 squared minus 8 times 0 to the fourth. So at t equals 0, our theta is equal to 0 radians. 
And then also, what is the point's angular velocity at t equals zero? So go ahead and try that out. You might be able to look at it and tell me the answer. There's a function for position, for angular position, and I want to know at t equals zero, what is the angular velocity? Remember omega is equal to d theta dt. What is my angular velocity at t equals zero? Zach, what is it? Uh, not zero. No. Harley? Yeah. You're about to say it. One. Right, so I just take the derivative of that function, and the derivative of this function with respect to t is going to be 1 plus 8t minus 32t cubed. I remember I take the exponent, multiply it by the coefficient, so this would be, and then take the uh, exponent minus 1, so that's uh, the derivative of a t to the n with respect to t is n times a times t to the n minus 1. Those are how we do derivatives of, of a polynomial, so make sure you're up on that. You should have had that already in calculus, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, at t equal 4 seconds, what is the point's angular velocity? What do we do in that case? I have the function here. What do I do? I just plug in t equal 4, so it's just 1 plus 8 times 4 seconds minus 32 times 4 cubed, 4 seconds cubed, plus 32 times 60, 64. I don't know what that is right off. You might know what that is. I have a number for that. I guess I can do that. Yeah, and then 33 minus that, I get minus 2015. That's the angular velocity in radians per second. And then also at t equal 2 seconds, what is the point's angular acceleration? What is going to be the function describing the acceleration? That's the derivative of what? Okay, you're right, the second derivative of the, the theta. So that's going to be d squared theta dt squared, Daniel said, which is also the derivative of omega dt, right? Uh, and omega is given by this function, so it's just the derivative of that. That's going to be 0 plus what? 8. What is it? Right, 96 t squared. So I take this, multiply it times that. 3 times 32 is 96. And then t to the 3 minus 1. That follows this form. This is like we did in chapter 2. You all remember doing this in chapter 2? I give you a function and you have to find the velocity. So it all applies here for, uh, for angular quantities as well. And then plug in t equal 2. That's 8 minus 96 times 4. What's that? 384. Is that right? 8 minus 384. Minus 376. And that's in radians per second squared. You could see something like this where I give you a function and I ask you to find particular values at different points. You, you should be up on that? You all okay with that? Yeah. 
if you do say something like that, that, that should be a good easy, you know, 10 points right off the bat. Because it's really just taking the derivative of those functions. No funky derivatives, just simple polynomials. Can I clear this? Yeah. Let's see what else we got. Yeah, these are all related to other things that we're doing. So uh, let's go on into the next section. But we're going to come back to kinematics because we'll start applying Newton's second law when we're dealing with torques and what have you. And kinematics will come back because then that we'll have torques that will produce acceleration. And then we'll have other questions about the velocity at particular times. See, I want y'all to do something for me, though. I've been working on this project. Uh, y'all used the form like you had on your test last time. I've been working on some software to, to analyze these forms. And I just need, like, a test run of them. So I just want you, I'm going to hand out some blank forms. Let's see, 3, 5, 8, 11, 15. Each of you will take two forms. And I just want you to, to bubble in some answers on it. Just do one per line, one answer per line. And then also bubble in your an identification number. Not your identification number, but just some random number that you use. Is that clear what I mean? Uh, also, please write in the number in the lines here. And then you can make up whatever name you want. Like the name that you're, you wish your mama gave you, but she didn't. You can write it right here. OK? Is that clear what I mean? Don't mind doing this. It's not for a grade or anything.
Okay, so let's move on to the cross products. Y'all won't get to cross products until top three, and I know some of you have already done it. Uh, we're going to see cross products in several different cases. Whenever we want to take the product of two vectors, in particular, we're going to take the product of one vector in one direction and the product of the two times the vector that's perpendicular to another vector. And so we'll need to do that with torques. When we get into torques, we'll multiply the, the force vector times the component of the moment arm that's in a perpendicular direction. That's 90 degrees to that. That's orthogonal. And we'll use the cross product for that. Um, the cross product, it's also called the vector product. It is the product of two vectors. Uh, the result of the cross product is orthogonal to both of the vectors. And of course, orthogonal means what? Do y'all know? Orthogonal. It just means perpendicular. So it's just like a fancy word for perpendicular. So, uh, so for example, the z-axis perpendicular to both the x and the y axes, or the z axis, so it's orthogonal to the x and y axes. Um, the magnitude of the cross product is equal to the area of the parallelogram that is bordered by the two vectors, like in this figure. So I have a vector A in this direction, and then a vector B in this direction, and those two vectors border this parallelogram here. So that B is this side and this side, and the vector A is this side and this side. And the magnitude of the cross product is just the area of this parallelogram. I'm going to describe physically when we get into torque what it means physically. But mathematically, it's just the area of that parallelogram. Uh, these are separated by an angle theta, and the area of that parallelogram is given by the magnitude of one of the vectors times the magnitude of the other vector times that sine of that angle. So the area of the parallelogram is this BA sine theta. Uh, so in terms of vectors, we would say the magnitude of the cross product. So this is the cross product, and the absolute value bars mean the magnitude is equal to A times B, the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the sine of the angle between them. As I said, it has several applications in physics. Anytime we want to multiply uh, two vectors together, but we just want to take the components that are perpendicular to one another, then we'll use the cross product. Uh, this is sort of contrary, or in contrast to the dot product. Remember the scalar product that we use with work? In work, what uh, components of the vectors did it take? Vectors that were perpendicular or vectors that were in the same direction? Same direction, right? And remember we had that cosine theta term for the work, the dot product between force and displacement. And so it took two vectors that were, or components of vectors that were in the same direction. 
But here we want to take vectors that are orthogonal to one another or perpendicular to one another. We'll see why this is important, like why we need to do that in just a minute when we get into torques. Uh, but for now, the cross product is just a tool that allows us to take the product of two vectors that are perpendicular to one another. Uh, so several applications, we'll use it for torques. Next semester, we'll also use it for uh, magnetic forces. Uh, but we'll, we'll deal with that next semester. Let's just do, go through a quick example. Let's say that I have two vectors, A and B. I'm just going to make them generic vectors, and we'll work through an example later. But A is just going to be AXI plus AYJ where AX is the magnitude of that X component and AY is the magnitude of the J component. And then B similarly is BXI plus BYJ. And so the cross product is going to be AXI plus AYJ crossed with BXI plus BYJ. How many use FOIL to expand this product? I realize that some of you, I guess one of you, in case you're the only one that's had count three, uh, y'all use this matrix method where you set up your vectors in a matrix, right? Oh, okay. All right, well, we're gonna use this, we're gonna use the right-hand rule. It'll be useful next semester when we're dealing with magnetic fields. So we'll just go ahead and introduce it here. Uh, anyway, so I'm gonna use FOIL to expand the product. That's first, uh, outer, inner, and then last, multiplying those out. So that's AX, BX, I cross I. So I'm basically taking out those, uh, the magnitudes of AX and BX. Those are scalar quantities. And so I'm just factoring those out and then taking the cross product of I and I, I cross I. Plus, uh, let's see, outer is AX, BY. I cross J plus inner is AYBX uh, J cross I plus the last which is AYBY J cross J now remember the our cross product A cross B is defined as a b sine theta so which of these terms will go away remember with the the dot product when we were doing work some of the terms went away uh several of the, or a couple of the terms went away so which terms will go away here the i cross j j cross i now remember with the dot product that was true that our j cross i and our i cross j terms went away and the reason was the dot product had that cosine theta term, and the cosine of 90 is equal to 0. But in this case, we have a sine term. So which, right, the ones that are in the same direction will cancel out, will go to 0, because the sine of 0 degrees is, is equal to 0. So all those that are parallel will go away. So we're going to lose i cross i, because that's equal to 0, and j cross j, because that's equal to 0. So we're left just with this expression, uh, AX, BY, I cross J, and AY, BX, J cross I. All right. Now, we need to determine these cross products have a certain direction. And so we need to figure out what those are. We're going to use the right-hand rule. Right-hand rule has a lot of different sort of variations. But you always use your right hand. In this picture, it shows, uh, it has it like this. So this is the, the direction of vector A. This is the direction of vector B. And my thumb goes in the direction of the cross product of those two vectors. So I let my index go in the direction of A. My uh, middle finger goes in the direction of B. And then my thumb gives A cross B. So if I'm thinking of I cross J, I draw my three-dimensional coordinate system here, i, j, and k. Right. Following this, I'm going to let my index finger 
go in the direction of I, but my middle finger point in the direction of J, and then my thumb would get the direction of the cross product. So the cross product I cross J then is in what direction? In the K direction. All right, so the cross product I cross J is equal to positive K. I'm going to show you a different way to do the right hand rule that's similar but a little bit different. Now what about the cross product J cross I? And it turns out that I cross J is not equal to J cross I. So I'll start with my index finger in the J direction, but then I need to orient it so that my middle finger is in the same direct is in the I direction. I have to rotate it around like that. And so now my uh, thumb points in which direction? In the negative direction. The negative what direction? The negative K direction, or the negative Z direction. So J cross I is equal to negative K. And this is a general rule that we'll always have, is that A cross B is equal to negative B cross A. If I switch the vectors, the placement of the vectors in the uh, cross product is the negative uh, of the previous. So A cross B is negative B cross A. Alright? Um, lots of different ways to do the right hand rule. If you look online, you'll find about 50,000 YouTube videos. You have to be careful because some of them actually use the left hand rule. So where you use your left hand instead of your right hand, and some of them just aren't correct. Um, I can do this in a different way. I like to do it this way, where I let my fingers, my four fingers, go in the direction of I. That's your first vector, so I'm looking at this cross product, and then they fold towards the second vector, all right? So they fold towards J, and then your thumb gives the direction of the, uh, the, the product, the cross product. Or right, you can imagine your fingers going in that direction, and then imagine that out of this palm, you have this second vector, all right? It's the same result, and then your thumb gives the direction of the uh, cross product. You'll probably don't do the right thing on count three, is that right? No, no. Right. That's useful, but it'll come up next semester when we're dealing with uh, magnetic fields, and you're just not going to be able to do that with magnetic fields. So, um, so it's a useful thing to do the right hand rule. The reason, of course, we use our right hand is why we live in a lot. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> in a place where we describe everything as a in a right handed coordinate system. Right? So if you use the left handed coordinate system, you can write it. Right. <laughs> okay, so we find the results of the ve unit vector cross products for the right hand rule. Oh, by the way, so let's just go ahead and do these. You know, this semester, using the right-hand rule isn't terribly important. If you just want to memorize these, that's fine. I cross J equals K. J cross I equals K. Uh, but there's also more. Like, you'd have to remember J cross K. Let's see, I don't remember. Is equal to I. And K cross J is equal to negative I. And then also uh, I cross K is negative J. I cross K like that would be negative J. I cross K is negative J. And K cross I is positive J. If you just want to memorize those, that's fine. Those are really the only six combinations. There's really only three to mem remember, right? Because if you switch them, they negate one another. So it's really just I cross J is equal to K, J cross K is I, and then K cross I is J. Isn't that right? J cross I. Yeah, that's right. And then the opposite, if you switch the terms, it negates the, the result. All right, cross product can be quite useful actually. Anytime we're dealing with two vectors that we need to multiply, components that are perpendicular to one another, uh, we'll use the cross product for that. So we'll do it this chapter uh, as well as next semester, sort of midway through. We'll see it again. All right, so to find the results for the unit vector, uh, I'll let the index of your right hand.
go in the direction of the first vector. And the middle finger go in the direction of the second vector. And then the thumb of your right hand gives the direction of the cross part. All right, uh, let's do a quick example. You will see this on the next exam. You'll have to do a cross product for sure. So make sure that's an easy, easy number of points for you. <coughs> let's see, I already did this, but I cross I is zero. I cross J is K. J cross I is negative K. And J cross J is zero. I thought I had an example here. That's not a blank page. Let's do an example though. Let's just, I'll give you a couple of vectors. You can try it on your own real quickly. Uh, let's say that I have a force vector that's uh, 3i plus 4j. And then I have a r vector that is, this is a moment arm. We're going to get into this next. Uh, that's equal to say negative 2i plus 1j and I want to know what is the torque and the torque is just the cross product of R and F so what is the torque if it's equal to R cross F give me just a moment I'll catch up with you I have an answer for it yet? <laughs> What'd you get, Josh? Uh, let's see. You're going to do... Anybody else get an answer? I'm not sure if that's right. I think it's 11. Let's see. What'd you do to get 24? 6, 3, I'm not sure. Let's see. So I do first, which gives, I don't do first actually because that's I cross I and that's equal to zero. So my only terms here that are going to contribute to the cross, cross product are those terms and these terms. Remember, because I cross I is zero, J cross J is zero. So that's going to be negative eight I cross J plus three J cross I. You multiply those? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, don't multiply them. Uh, and then I add these up. So I have uh, negative 8k, i cross j is k, plus 3 times negative k. And I just add them up. Negative 8 plus negative 3 is negative 11k. So my, my torque, which I'll define in just a bit, is equal to negative 11k. All right. I say cross product's pretty useful. You'll have to do it on the test, but it'll be in the context of a larger problem. We're going to see a couple of cases where the cross product comes up in physical scenarios. Um, I meant to ask, did we finish the concept test for Chapter 7? You all recall? You might keep track of that in the back. I don't remember. I think so. You don't think so. We did some of it, though, right? Why tell me? Which one are we on, Cole? Oh, we're on the red ones, right. 
Or they're, they're all red, I guess. We did this one? We did this one? No, alright. Yeah, let's try, there's just a few more. So let's uh, finish this up. An object's rotating at five revolutions per second. What is its approximate angular velocity in radians per second? About 10 more seconds, 15 seconds maybe. Stop at 125, 125. Okay, okay, let's see. So 31 is the right answer. You can see a problem like this in the multiple choice, but also just you might see it embedded within a kinematics problem where you have some units but I asked for the answer in other units so at five revolutions per second I know that one revolution is how many radians in it how many right there are two pi two pi is approximately two times three or six five times six is approximately thirty but from the multiple choice answers we know it must be thirty one Uh, consider a child who is swinging. As she reaches the lowest point in her swing, which of these statements is true? Or not true as it may be. This little girl, she's... Swinging back and forth. Want to know at this lowest point what is true about her swing. Stop at 112, 112. Right, B is the right answer. Uh, the tension in the rope is equal to her weight. That would be true if, if what were the case? If she was just still, if she was stationary. In fact, if I look at the forces involved down here, I do have the tension in the rope, Ft. But then I also have the weight, and if she wasn't moving, that tension would equal the weight. However, I know that the sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration, and the tension would equal the weight if the acceleration were zero, but I know that the acceleration isn't zero because her velocity is changing direction. And so the sum of the forces, which is Ft minus Fw, is going to equal m times v squared over r. So the tension then will actually equal mv squared over r plus the weight. All right, so the tension here is actually greater than the weight, so it's not a. Uh, what about the tension in the rope is equal to her mass times acceleration? Well, her mass times her acceleration, this would be m times ar, 
which is equal to mv squared over r. Right. And this is saying that that's equal to the tension, but if we look at the forces over here, the tension isn't equal to that mass times acceleration because we also have the weight. And then also her acceleration is downward at 9.8 meters per second squared. That's also not true. Uh, first of all, what is the direction of her acceleration? It's not, no, it's not to the side. It's what? It's a centripetal acceleration, and a centripetal acceleration is always what? Towards the center. So her acceleration is always towards the center. That's our centripetal acceleration. And so none of these are true. So D is the right answer. Um, I would look back at some questions on the exams. I'll show you when we're done that deal with this further. There are some questions about centripetal velocity or centripetal acceleration and forces in the homework, but I'm going to direct y'all to some questions as well in the old exams. All right, a rigid object is rotating with uh, angular speed less than zero, so a negative angular velocity, and the angular velocity and the acceleration vectors are anti-parallel. That means they're in opposite directions. Uh, the angular speed of the rigid object is what? So I have a negative angular speed, a positive angular acceleration. What's the speed of the rigid object? What's it doing? All right, so a few more seconds. I'm going to stop at 125. All right, so B is the right answer. Uh, I know it's clockwise because it's negative, right? And I know that it's decreasing because the acceleration is positive. So I have a negative omega and a positive alpha. That means that it's slowing down. We had that in chapter two, remember? If the acceleration and velocity are in opposite directions, it's slowing down. So B was the right answer. And do you know why you can never hear a pterodactyl go to the bathroom? Yeah. Have I told that one? Or do you just know it? I don't know. I told that one. Shoot. Oh, sorry. How about another potty jerk? You want another potty jerk? Is that okay? This one's kind of gross, actually, if you think about it. What's the difference between roast beef and pea soup? I don't know. Anybody can roast beef. Uh, that was about as bad as they did. All right. Um, let me show you some problems. Now. We'll let you go. Um, let's see. I had some problems here. These are all with cross products. They're good problems. More kinematics problems. One in particular.
Uh, I don't see it right off. I'll, I'll try to find it and I'll uh, try to send y'all some more questions about centripetal forces and what have you uh, that you can look at. But the homework has some as well. So you should be looking at the homework. Uh, hopefully finished with the homework for chapter 7 by now, right? Are you? Seriously? Alright. We all have a good day, okay? I'll see you uh, Friday. Not long till the next...